on how to write an abstract. And our speaker today is Dr. Kirsten Benson, uh, who is the director of the Judith Anderson Herbert Writing Center, which serves all UT students writing in any subject, any course. She teaches courses in qualitative research methods and persuasive writing. Her recent publications include studies of international graduate student writing and the preparation of new writing instructors. And she's also the co-author and editor of the textbooks used in UT's first year composition courses. So today's workshop will outline the purpose, reader expectations, and general structure of an abstract, which is a genre used to communicate complex ideas concisely for other researchers. Okay, Dr. Benson, please take the way. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for being here um, to hear a little bit about how to write an abstract. And a lot of what I have to say, of course, um, tries to navigate a kind of um, you know, road. We're assuming that some of you may have written abstracts, you know, at some point and are trying to uh, get some tips for how to do that better. And maybe some of you um, have certainly encountered abstracts in your research, but haven't had to write one yet. So um, hopefully this will be um, stuff that is either new for you or um, something that will help you uh, kind of do abstract, write abstracts just a little bit better because it's all, it's, it's such a uh, interesting genre um, that does take a lot of practice, I think, to get good at. So, um, so even if you've already written some before, hopefully some of what we have to say um, will help you, again, improve a little bit further. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, open up the slideshow. And I actually have this as a, um, as a Adobe Express slideshow. So which I'll, I can, um, in addition to the recording, of course, I can send a link to, uh, actually I'll put a link to the presentation, I think in the chat later. Um, so, um, yeah, so let me just start with something that I always like to um, refer to when I talk about academic writing, um, and that is the idea of entering a scholarly conversation. Um, this is a quote from um, a, a philosopher named Kenneth, uh, and rhetorician named Kenneth Burke, um, who was writing quite a few decades ago, but his words, I think, um, so nicely capture, I think, the situation that we are always in when we're writing um, in an academic situation, and that is um, the idea of having a scholarly conversation. So this is um, his quote. He asks us to imagine a situation where we enter into a parlor. Now, a parlor at that time was something a little bit different, but think of it as just some kind of gathering of, of people. This, this picture here is sort of like a cocktail party, but any kind of gathering that um, where people are you know, just sort of not just letting, not just socially getting to know each other, but a, a situation in which people are engaged in talking about ideas. Um, so, you know, just 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 like we all do when we get into a scholarly situation, um, you come late um, to the to the conversation, and when you arrive, um, others have been there before you. This is exactly the situation that we're all in when we're trying to do scholarly research. That is, um, we always um, are late to the conversation. There's always so much that has been written before we enter the scene. Um, and um, there's a lot of different uh, sort of agreements and disagreements um, that are being had among scholars about you know, any number of issues. And we um, sort of have to try to find our way into what the conversations are. So um, there, you know, people are engaged in the conversation, don't really have time to, you know, fill us in um, because they're too busy talking with each other about stuff that they know. Um, so as a, as a new scholar or as an emerging scholar, um, part of the part of the job is to listen to what is being said, and that's the reading. Say, for example, that we do um, when we're trying to get up to speed on any given topic, right? So. Um, and by the, after you read enough, there might be a point when you decide that you have something to offer, and that's when you might be, um, you know, writing an article or presenting a, a presentation at a conference um, or writing a paper for a class, um, something 
um, to sort of give your contribution. Um, and so then it's in the mix and it's in the conversation. Um, and someone then might come back to you and say like, hey, what about this and what about that? And so then you are part of that that conversation um, you know that that the, that the scholars have been having and you try to sort of defend your own position um, and give reasons for what you've done um, and then they they say like either okay you know that sounds good or what about this and so again it sort of goes on and on um, and finally there's a point where everyone has to just disband for a little while um, and you know come come back to to the conversation in another day Day. So again, like this is sort of that the, the situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, and, you know, some of the sort of rules about academic uh, conversations and about the written forms of academic conversations really do try to follow some of the expectations that scholars have about what they need to hear from us um, as a scholar in the conversation. Um, about a particular topic. So this is where the abstract form um, comes into play. Um, and let me see if I can get this to move forward. Here we go. Okay, so um, so just, just in terms of some of the expectations, again, about the abstract form, you know, really about academic writing period, you know, is the emphasis that we, a lot of times we, we place on you know, the effort, obviously, to try to do a good job as writers, um, and a, a common thought is that, you know, like writing is really that, you know, being successful as a writer is really all about, you know, having particular skills or knowledge, and it's easy to sort of understand how that is uh, sort of a common thought about writing, um, because writing is one of those situations where, you know, there's, it's, it, it feels like it's you and your brain with, you know, your laptop or your notebook, um, and it feels really solitary. Um, and in reality, it is you putting those words down on paper. Um, but, you know, really success is, is, you know, being successful, especially in these highly specialized genres like the abstract, is about to what extent you actually meet the expectations of your readers. And they really do have expectations, but when you're sitting, again, you and your laptop, you and your computer, um, it's a little bit hard to imagine like that there are readers out there. And it's an actually a kind of extra step that most of us have to take to think there really are other people out there who are, um, you know, who, who want to know certain things from me and whose expectations I have to satisfy. And it's kind of like a sort of thing that you always have to keep reminding yourself, like, what do they expect of me? And the more that you know of their expectations, you know, and, and how to satisfy those expectations, that's really where success as a writer comes from or sort of develops. Um, so um, with the abstract form, you know, while it is short, which is definitely um, a sometimes a virtue, um, it also can be a hindrance, you know, because a lot of times it's a, an attempt to consolidate or compress a huge amount of information in just a very small amount of, of, of words. So, um, you know, but so what, you know, what exactly are we trying to do when um, we are writing abstracts and what are those expectations that readers have of us? Well, obviously, you know, the idea that it really needs to be a concise or short preview of your research focus, um, what methods you took um, for, you know, you know, sort of coming to the conclusions or findings that you had, what those results are and what makes them significant. Um, any, if, if any, I assume, you know, that you are reading abstracts quite frequently. Um, and if you think about sort of what you do with abstracts, it probably falls into the, you, the common category of trying to see whether a particular article will be useful, you know, to your study. You know, so, you know, like, and that's really the one of the biggest expectations on the part of any reader of an abstract is, you know, can I find out from the abstract that is, 
you know, if I only read the abstract, will I know whether or not this study, this article is one that I should read, you know, that one that I should spend more time with um, because it's relevant to my own, my own work. And what do you need to know there? Again, what was the topic? How did they do it? What were their key findings? And what was the significant in significance in light of the conversation that's being being um, addressed? So that's really the those are the the key things that any abstract um, is trying to do for its its readers. Um, one of the nice parts of that is that they're really that means that you know as a form unlike some more complex forms like a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation or even a seminar paper um, you know for a capstone course um, an abstract has really just five parts um, and they really don't vary very much at all now we're going to look at um, a couple of examples where um, we'll see some people leaving out some of the parts, and I'll talk a little bit about why that might be the case. But you can never, ever go wrong um, with an abstract with um, just thinking of you know, the, the four major parts, and I added the fifth one, the title, because of course um, your study is going to have a title, but the four major parts you can't go wrong in, in creating any abstract by having these four parts um, present in some way and usually in a particular order um, as, as shown here on the screen. Um, the introduction first, obviously like a key, the key problem, the question that's driving the inquiry um, and you know the sort of the thing that you are contributing to it then some uh, attention to the methods that were taken to get to, um, to um, the results that you are about to mention, then something about the results themselves, and then finally um, a, a conclusion. In this case, I, I, I like calling it significance, the kind of so what, what makes this, what makes these results or um, these findings really important given the overall conversation that um, that was being, you know, that was being addressed. So, you know, one of the biggest questions, you know, for many people who are, um, you know, I'd say again, sort of emerging scholars, um, developing scholars is, you know, how do you get to the point where you really are able to uh, kind of become a, a more expert writer of an abstract um, because there is there is certainly you can follow a formula you know again have the those four parts the intro the methods the results and then the significance but again because of the um, the way in which you're compressing so much information that's really the hard part um, if you, most people will write their abstract after they've written um, the article itself, that's not always the case. Sometimes people will write an abstract when they are proposing a study, say that you want to present at a conference um, and you don't have all of the work done, but you know kind of what you're going to do. So you haven't written the whole thing. You don't have your methods yet. But m most cases, in most scholarly situations, you're going to write your abstract after the say the longer work is done, um, and then again, as you can as you can imagine, um, the goal is um, you know to what do you what do you put in to the abstract and what do you leave out. So one of the one of the best approaches that I would recommend to anybody who's trying to get on top of this kind of genre and really on top of any genre um, that is specialized. Um, it is to really to look at sample abstracts, you know, from, from people in your field. So one of the things that I'd like to suggest to people is to um, open up an issue of a journal that they um, are familiar with, the one that's used commonly in, in your field, um, and just try to read as many articles or abstracts um, from that, from that issue of the journal as you can um, and to, 
you know, because the, our abstract is relatively short to read, uh, it's not necessarily short to write, but it's short to read. You can you can read quite a few of them, you know, in just even an hour's time. So even doing something like that, spending an hour here and there to examine some sample abstracts is a really good way to um, try to identify what some of the usual ways that people in your field um, handle these four parts of the abstract. Because while there are, you know, again, usually the four parts will show up in almost any abstract, the amount of attention that um, people in different fields um, devote to each of the four parts will can vary quite significantly, um, where um, especially across uh, sort of those larger kind of academic uh, discipline, disciplinary categories like the sciences, um, you know, natural sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, um, the arts. You'll see people in um, these different fields handling those, the, the, you know, the introduction, say some spending more time on the introduction and some spending less time, some spending much more time on methods um, and some spending very little time on methods. So they might be there, but they'll be there in different sort of proportions or different amounts of attention. So some of the ways that you, again, get to know this for your field um, is to do this sort of examining some sample abstracts I'm trying to look for. How do they identify the topic of their research? How do they kind of show the reader that the research is credible? Obviously, that has to do something with like the methods themselves and the way that they talk about their results. How do they establish the significance of what they have to have to offer? And this is this is not something that you can learn in the generic. Um, I mean, I could sit here and tell you that generally, you know, science, uh, natural science writers and social science writers do tend to spend more time in their abstracts on the methods section um, than, say, humanities uh, disciplines do. But knowing that doesn't really help you, you know, figure out how much to put in, you know, for the methods um, in your field. And so, like, that's where just getting reading more abstracts, you know, will help you to build up that that knowledge. So I thought we would maybe look at um, one of these, um, and I'm going to actually just link over to um, to this. It'll be easier to read, I think. Here, let me try to scroll this up for you. Um, oh, and actually, I'm going to go ahead and put this handout in the chat also, so that you can um, so that you can look at it um, yourself. Let me get that in there. Oh, my chat. My chat window must be hiding somewhere. Um, okay, I'll do my best to just um to sort of show this to you and then when I find the again, I think my head I have two screens open, so sometimes the um the Chat window likes to hide at this point. Let me just get back here. All right, so we'll just go on to um, just looking at it on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do is just read a sample abstract. So this is um, something uh, sort of in an agricultural field, right? So weed is one of the, I'm gonna go ahead and read it just so you can to sort of hear how it sounds also. Um, wheat is one of the key cereal crops grown worldwide, um, providing the primary caloric and nutritional source for millions of people around the world in order to ensure food security and sound, actionable mitigation strategies and policies for management of food shortages, timely and accurate estimates of global crop production are essential. This study combines a new BRDF corrected daily surface reflectance data set developed from NASA's moderate resolution imaging spectro radiometer with detailed official crop statistics to develop an empirical generalized approach to forecast wheat yields. 
The first step of this study was to develop and evaluate a regression-based model for forecasting winter wheat production in Kansas. This regression-based model was then directly applied to forecast winter wheat production in Ukraine. The forecast of production in Kansas closely matched the USDA and NAS, NASS reported numbers with a 7% error. The same regression model forecast winter wheat production in Ukraine within 10% of the official reported production numbers six weeks prior to har harvest. Using new data from MODIS, this method is simple, has limited data requirements, and can provide an indication of winter wheat production shortfalls and surplus prior to harvest in regions where minimal ground data is available. So thinking back to those four parts that I mentioned, the introduction where there's like the, the uh, question, the issue, you know, the topic is established, the methods, results, and significance. One of the things you wanna think about is how have they done this in this? So I've uh, sort of color coded this out for us um, here where we see um, the, you know, obviously the first part of it, wheat is one of the key cereal crops. So how do, how does any reader know what the study is about, period, right? You do that right away in the abstract. Now think about the difference between that and say an article, you know, where you spend quite a bit more time, you know, even though you have like an introduction, you usually don't start with the very first sentence being the key like piece of information um, from the whole article, you know, from what the what the study is even um, about. So the um so the so the very first sentence. Like it might be more like something that um, is is gotten to maybe mid introduction in like say the regular article. So the very first sentence has to has to tell somebody again what is the study even about? Period. What is it investigating? Um, so then you know you get then to the second part where it's like the more specific. You got the general question that the study is investigating. And then you have this specific um, sort of, um, you know, purpose, you know, the study is combining a new BDRF corrected daily surface reflectance data set. So you see, you hear something new about this, um, and then you get a little bit of information about methods here. The first step was to develop and evaluate um, a regression-based model. Um, and then apply it to another situation. So you see the methods there. Um, then we get uh, a little bit of the of the results. Um, the forecast closely matched um, the USDA NASS reported numbers and giving the percentage of the um, of the the uh, error. And then finally, the significance using new data from MODIS, um, sort of this method is simple, has limited data requirements. So it's telling you something about the, the um, you know, approach that they use that is really you know, useful for uh, why other people may want to also use this. So there's that significance. Um, so again, you see these four parts, you know, obviously in just a few words, giving us quite a lot of information, um, exactly what an abstract um, is supposed to do. So if we, if we looked um, at, at the next one, um, I wonder whether, um, you know, whether you all might be able to sort of see and if anyone wants to, um, again, for some reason, I'm not be able to see. Dr. That. Benson, I yeah. was able to share the document in the chat. Thank you. I saw that. And I'm just, I am for myself trying to figure out why I'm not seeing the chat when I click on it. But it, again, it must be something to do with uh, how many screens I have open. So, um, so if you're putting something in the chat, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. Um, but you can monitor that too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to say or just like unmute themselves and say what they think, the what parts do they see? Introduction, methods, um, you know, results and significance in this one, which sentences might be um, any one of those four parts. 
if anyone wants to be brave and volunteer. <laughs> Or put it in the chat, and again, maybe you can look at it for me, Sandra. Any any takers here? So obviously, we have the beginning. Um, we know what what the problem is, right? Something is wrong with this situation here. Um, something has not happened. Um, someone people don't. Uh, approach it from a particular point of view. Um, so then the paper, you know, there's a, here's what this paper is going to do. Um, so looking at this one, I'll just scroll down here. Like we see, um, we see some of the parts. Um, and what I wanted to do in illustrating this is saying that obviously, again, here, there's some differences. Like these are these are all published abstracts. These are part of this is something that came out in a real journal. So the fact that it doesn't have exactly all the parts is not like a deal breaker. Do we find out enough, you know, for you know, for someone to be like, yes, like this is a credible article done well? Um, yes. I mean, obviously, again, this was this study was published. So we there's something that's important about this that probably allows an editor to say like, yeah, the abstract doesn't have all the parts I usually look for, but there's enough of promise about this article, you know, that, that I'm going to go ahead and say like, yeah, it doesn't really matter because there's enough here to make someone probably want to read the article. And that is the fact that they have a kind of novel approach. Most contributions don't address this from a stakeholder's perspective. And so this one is going to actually give um, some information that um, like people don't yet have. So there's enough of a draw, you know, to say like, okay, that we do we have all the all the methodological stuff? Mm, not maybe not as clearly as the other one, but so enough to say like this is valid research. So um, so like those are some of the kind of differences or nuances that you might see in looking at different different abstracts in your field. And sort of always you want to ask, like, if they don't have the four parts or if the four parts aren't always handled the same way, why? And usually the question is, is what is given enough to draw readers in um, to like to read this article? You know that they know you know, know will be credible and offer something of value to that scholarly conversation that that you're in. So that's where the sort of how you you would decide like whether or not the the abstract is you know like um, better rather than not as good. So. Um, so let me go back here then to, um, you know, to just a few, a few points, uh, like just to kind of make a, a, a connection to something that you already know about, um, you know, like about writing or about certain kind of uh, like sort of storytelling and how that connects to the abstract form. Um, you really are telling a story through your abstract and really through your article as a whole. But the abstract, you know, again, sort of has these identifiable parts. So you've got this nice beginning, you know, where it's like once upon a time, people thought one thing, right? Um, they believed that something was true, but there's, you know, like maybe um, so far, like that's where, you know, like where the conversation has been up to this point. Um, but then there's some kind of problem. So you as the scholar have sort of found out that there's like something wrong with what we know or something that's missing, some part of the picture that really hasn't come. So here's, again, story sort of format, story structure that all of us intuitively know. Um, that is like that second part, like that's sort of um, the beginning of, well, here's something that I have the answer to. So then you're coming in as the protagonist. I've got some kind of solution to this problem, right? Um, I've got one little thing that might add something to resolve this problem or this, you know, complication um, that that we've all experienced and that we all want to know, like sort of, um, you know, how this turns out. So you've got something new to add to the picture. Um, and then the plot, of course, is the methods, 
right? Um, here's how, you know, here's how I ended up knowing what I know, right? So that you're engaging in sort of the methods of your research. Um, so again, a direct connection to, to story structure, which if you're ever sitting there wondering, okay, what do I do next? And here are some things that you can sort of fall back on your intuitive understanding of, of story structure. So finally, you get to the point where it's like the happy ending. I mean, I know all stories don't have a happy ending, but even in research, um, like finding out um, something is not the case, you know, not what you hypothesized is itself a happy ending because it's knowing something, it's finding out something that we didn't know before. And as you all know from your research, you know, like that's as valuable if, you know, sometimes that's, you know, like, you know, every people's careers um, can be spent, you know, sort of crossing things off, you know, what, it, what something couldn't be. So they're always sort of not necessarily finding the answer that they hope for, but they find other answers. So this is all valuable work. So, um, so my theory is, or my assertion is that all, you know, all knowledge, all findings are happy endings, um, regardless of whether they're what you hope to find or not. Um, and that, you know, again, obviously is what you're sort of presenting at the end of your, um, end of your abstract. So, um, so just in terms of the methods, we I talked about this a little bit, um, in turn, and when we looked at that, um, the second example, um, so another, Another thing that you can do, because methods is usually the part that most people struggle with the most when writing an abstract, because again, it's probably the hardest to kind of uh, sort of make short, you know, because it's like, what do I leave in? What do I, you know, what do I take out? What steps are important for someone else to know that I engaged in um, versus all of the steps? you know, that, that I went through in order to do this research. And so here again, you know, the reading of other journals in your fields, um, one of the best suggestions that I heard actually from an undergraduate scholar was, um, was the following, where they took um, a research article and read the article, um, you know, from a journal in their field. And then they tried to make just a short sort of outline for themselves, you know, just what the methods were. So just a one, two, three, four, however many steps that they saw in the article. And then went back to the abstract and looked at the abstract to see how many of those methods or which of those methods were actually mentioned in the abstract and tried to decide, okay, why were the certain methods like presented in the abstract compared to the numerous ones that were in the methods section. Um, and so knowing that difference helped them to sort of come to an understanding of what was, uh, you know, like what you could prioritize to include in the methods in, in the abstract versus the you know, much more voluminous sort of description of the methods that you have to do in the body of the article. So looking at that, um, for any articles that you do read, if you engage in a little bit of analysis like that, again, sort of kind of, you know, sort of do a little lesson on, you know, methods, um, presentation of methods, you know, while you're reading some of the articles that you're reading anyway, this will, this is the kind of thing that will help you develop that sense of, you know, again, which is more important to include, because there's, again, just no generic answer to this. There's no one set answer. It's so dependent on many factors that have to do with the particulars of, you know, the study, um, the field, and so forth. So it's only something that you can kind of develop a sense of by, like I said, sort of engaging in a sort of you know, intentional analysis of, of the types of things that are done in your field. Obviously, you want to talk to your lab PI, your GT, you know, the GTA in your course, your professor, um, a faculty member, you know, talk about this kind of stuff that, you know, sort of, you know, see like, okay, like, why is this one like the one that's, you know, being used rather than another? Because you're certainly not expected to be able to maybe get all those, all those answers to all of those things all on your own. Let me just go back for a second to that um, to that handout, the abstracts, um, and just look at a couple more of these. This is page five and six here. Um, so here's one where, again, the methods. You know, there's very, um, very, very brief 
um, you know, much more short and abstract than the other ones. Um, here, the person just comes right out. The main purpose of this paper is to do X. Um, and then the principal components technique was used to build. Um, so there's a description of what was done, but not really me conventional methods, um, you know, like that we might expect to see in some cases. Um, an econometric inference on the regional growth was made using the spatial panel data um, to find the, the direct and indirect effects. Again, sort of a brief description, but not anything more detailed and actually, um, you know, no, no results here. Um, here again is um, another, another different uh, sort of version. Um, so I'm trying to kind of just illustrate the the fact again of the variety that you're going to see here and you'll have this link in the handout um you know and in the slideshow uh, so you can look at this a little bit more um, but you see um, a little bit more detail in this one um, so um, you know, you've got four high resolution topographically corrected climate maps. The feature map is derived from an ensemble of 32 climates. So there's a lot more specific detail. So the question that I have when I read this is not my feel, but I, I look at it and I say, okay, why did they need that kind of detail here? What is that, how is that relevant to someone in this field to know that level of specificity about like what they were looking at? And I know obviously that it is important. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that, you know, as you, if you're in this field, that's what you wanna know, like why, why, why were those details um, sort of isolated more than others. So, um, you know, so again, you're, you're being able to kind of go back and just do that kind of analysis. So, um, so let me just move forward then to the idea of um, how do you achieve that brevity? Um, so, you know, the conciseness So this is, it actually becomes rather than a drafting problem, sort of what do you have in all the stuff that I was talking about before, which is really sort of part of your first draft. Um, you know, you got all the parts, the introduction, the methods, the results, the significance, you've put it all in there. Hopefully, I will say your first draft is quite long, um, because that's generally the case. I, I always like to uh, remind people that you don't really have to edit as you compose. That editing, you can save your editing for like a second round, that you don't have to get everything perfect the first time you put it on the page. Um, and that usually that tends up being more of a, a block um, to writers rather than a help. So trying to be messy, allow yourself to be long-winded in, in a first draft and not be correct, you know, to just kind of put things down to kind of get the gist of it all. And then engage in a in a period of time when then you're going to start whittling it down. So um, you know this process of cutting things out, uh, no matter what, for most abstract writers, even if you are kind of careful as you compose, um, there's usually a step where you're still going to have to try to say, do I need all these words? You know, and sometimes there are uh, you know, strict guidelines, you know, about say you've got only a hundred words. Some abstracts, of course, are a little bit longer um, and there's a range on that, but they're not usually very long. So in a hundred words is not very much real estate to deal with. So um, it can be quite challenging to sort of whittle down. But here's where like editing and uh, kind of some techniques for editing um, where you have to learn, you be, be willing to chop things out of your draft. So again, going over to the handout, we're gonna look at the Aguilar example here on page eight. Um, I sort of, I, I highlighted a few things, you know, the parts, again, you see the, the intro and the methods, and then we have some findings, but I highlighted this one part, and I know that you're not really having time to read um, this whole thing here, but there's a part here that I would say ends up being more information than the reader needs. Now, again, this is a published abstract, so it's perfectly fine as is. And um, I'm, I'm looking at this for from the point of view of just illustrating um, something that if this person was asked to uh, cut some words out, where could they do so? Um, and, and here, this is this part overall, the heartland resource region had the lowest 
crop diversity, whereas the fruitful rim had the highest. In contest, in contrast to the other resource regions, they had significantly higher crop diversity. Um, there's kind of a bit of repetition in these. There's a lot of repeated words. So to my eye, as like someone who's like looking for things to cut out, this one looks like something where there's some information in here that ends up sounding repetitive um, and so could, is a target for editing to sort of what could be cut out without losing um, like significant content content um, from the from the from the uh, you know from the overall meaning. So another example of cutting out um, is looking uh, even at a more finely tuned uh, sort of lens. Um, you know, like how can you look for certain uh, types of phrases that we tend to write um, when we're composing um, that um, are again targets for you as an editor. So one of my favorite ones, and I learned this from uh, one of my colleagues who's now retired, Dr. Hurst, who has a nice series of tutorials on editing and professional writing. Um, and he, and I'm, I'm gonna show you that in a minute, but one of the things that, um, that he um, taught me and a lot of other people was to look for prepositional phrases in your writing. So when we compose, and when we speak, a lot of us tend to use a lot of prepositional phrases. This review focuses on the use of paired catchment studies for determining the changes in water yield at various time scales, resulting from permanent changes in vegetation. Now, it's not that prepositions are bad, inherently bad, or anything like that in any way. It's that what we do as writers oftentimes is we tend to string these along with each other, right? And you know, sort of have these highly kind of, um, you know, sort of complicated sort of, you know, presentations of a con concept that's strung out across a sentence and that very likely could be made much more direct, much more uh, concise. So one of the editing tricks or tips that Dr. Hurst always recommended was look for these strung along prepositional phrases that's your key as an editor to say, hmm, I could actually make this shorter. So it's just identifying these and you say, okay, this is a sentence that I could work on to try to make it shorter. And I'm going to show you in a second a couple of examples of that from, from, his, um, from, his, um, from his work. Let me go ahead and show you that here. No, I have to be in present mode to get to this. Here we go. Um, okay, so this is his professional writing style tutorial. And um, he's talking about what he calls trimming the fat. Um, so one of the nice things I like about Hearst's um, editing um, style tutorial guidelines is that he what he does is he gives you like a really sort of short example you know like he's got all these different lessons um, just a short introduction to what it is and then he's got a worksheet um, that gives you a chance to practice um, the the principle that he's just illustrated and I want to go down here to um, exercise two to illustrate the prepositional phrases um, that I was just talking about. So here, we are in a position to resupply you with widgets in the event that your existing supply becomes exhausted. So what you would have the opportunity to do if you were doing this practice, and sometimes um, this kind of practice is exactly what we need to do. I mean, no one loves to say like, hey, do some exercises, you know, <laughs> sentence level writing exercises, but every now and then it really can be useful to kind of build up a nice sense of, of how to do this cutting. So you could put something in here and and then open up this little, uh, the little, um, the little plus sign here, where he's given you an example of a way to um, to have revised this. Now, in every case, there's never just one right answer, but it gives you some immediate feedback of a way that that sentence could have been revised as taking out those prepositional phrases. So instead of saying we are in a position to resupply you, it's 
we can resupply you. So much more straightforward um, with widgets in the event that your existing supply becomes exhausted, becomes if you run out of widgets. So, you know, again, so just trying to see that I had those prepositional phrases sort of strung out across a sentence. Could I make it shorter? Yes, here's one way to do it. So this is, again, for, for writing abstracts, this is one of the key skills, the editing skills to achieve that, you know, conciseness, the short, um, you know, nature of the form and to be as direct um, and clear as possible, which is one of those expectations. You don't want your readers reading your sentences and kind of getting lost in the nuances of them. You want to be really clear. So these are the kinds of, uh, this is the kind of clarity that you're striving for. So some uh, taking a look at some of these kinds of tips, I think can be really useful for any writer um, in, you know, in, in, you know, who's trying to work on, on editing. Okay, just a couple more things and um, just a sort of reminders, like obviously just in terms of your process, you all know this as busy uh, scholars, you know, that the more that you kind of plan out and make a plan for um, things that you um, are trying to, you know, all the things that you have to do, the better, right? And that's true, of course, for, um, for the abstract, but I want to recommend one major part of this, um, and that is getting feedback, right? Even, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm an honor student, you know, like I'm a, a top scholar, like I don't, you know, like I already know how to write. Um, I don't need, I don't really need anyone to help me. Well, it's not that you need help with, um, you know, like sort of the basics of writing, but every writer benefits from getting feedback from, you know, a trusted reader. Um, if you talk to any of your professors, they will always tell you that they would never consider sending out an article that they wrote for publication to a journal where they're, where they're going to get peer review, like blind reviewers, right? They would never consider sending that out to anyone before they ask a, a colleague that they know to read over their work um, and to give them feedback on it. So there's this a long tradition of the value of getting feedback on, on writing because having someone else look at what you have to say and try and asking them, is this clear? Does this make sense to you? Is there a better way that I could do this? Is there something that I'm leaving out? Is there something that I need to pay more attention to? Some of those bigger issues um, that are not, you know, about like whether or not you can write well at the sentence level, but it's about how you are sort of embracing the expectations and the norms of academic discourse and achieving that high scholarly standard um, that you're trying to achieve. And that's where every writer, again, benefits. So I would always want to recommend to people, especially, um, again, sort of emerging and aspiring scholars um, to, to really not forget the value of feedback. Um, one last thing that I wanted to just, if you, if you ever sort of find yourself, you know, stuck for just, how do, just getting going, right? Um, here's like a little a form that you could use. Obviously, it's, you know, not anything that you would use like exactly, um, you know, like in any way um, to turn into anybody, but just to kind of get yourself going. The abstract is really a form that benefits from being thought of in some ways as a template, right, just to, again, to get going. Um, so here's like something where you could say, you know, thinking about your own topic, you know, common way of looking at here's my subject, right, is to, and here's that sort of, this is how usually people think about it. Um, here's a little bit of information about that, but here's this problem. So a few things where you could fill in some information just to get the ball rolling in your mind, if that's something that you're sort of stuck on how to get started, which I know for a lot of people can be one of those roadblocks that makes them put off doing something. And I'm like, I can't get started. I'll come back to it later. So this is just a little way that you can get those wheels turning just a little bit uh, more, you know, just possibly more quickly so you can get you know, kind of back, back on track. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you is um, how you can get feedback from us. Um, so sorry for the going back and forth on this. Um, the, I, 
I want to give you information about the Writing Center. So we are open in the summer. So if you're working on stuff this summer, but also, again, if you're working on um, some things in the fall, we are open in the summer. We have you know fewer hours in the summer than we do in the regular year, but we're still here. Um, and here's the the link where you would um, you know where you would enter our um, our portal. Let me show you where that is. I'm just going to quickly show you how to get into it. So if you haven't already used our services, you basically are just going to register for a free account um, right here where you know click right there. Um, and I can put in a password at the same time. You're going to select the undergraduate writing help um, and then log in. And what you'll see is a variety of um, open appointments, so white appointments, white boxes or times that are available. Like I said, in the summertime, we have um, just less demand for, for help from our services, but in the regular year, you would see, you know, hundreds, you know, for the week. Um, so what you would do, and I'm just going to go back to a previous week and use an um, old one. Um, so you would open up the one of those boxes and you basically are just... Um, you know, making the appointment in the summer. We're online only. In the regular year, you have the option to work either in person or online. But you just fill out the various information that we ask for. Um, and I'll just skip down. You sort of give a little bit of information about what you want, um, answer the rest of these questions, and then you're just going to create the appointment. Um, when it comes time to um, to Joining the appointment, you will see that you just come back to this same this same place um, where you made the appointment. If you have an online appointment, you just basically open that box and you just click start or join online consultation, and that will take you right into the Zoom room with the tutor. If you were, if it's in the fall or spring, for example, you might choose an in-person appointment and you would find the location information right over here beside the person's name, um, plus an email that you got a confirmation about. So, um, so that's, it's very simple. Um, and, you know, again, it's a great way for you to get some feedback um, from us. Let me go ahead and just stop there and just see whether anyone has any questions. Um, and um, again, for some reason I'm not just seeing the chat, but um, oh, actually I see it now. So it finally popped up for me on my other screen. So if you do have anything, if you want to put it in the chat, um, that would be great, or just unmute and happy to address any questions that you might have. I was wondering, Sandra, if you wanted to mention anything that anything that you, I mean, now that you're, uh, you've done this quite a few times, I imagine, you know, like any, any things that you've learned in the process that you might want to share? Sorry to put you on the spot like that. No, that, <laughs> uh, no that's perfectly fine. It might be reiterating a little bit of what you said, but I think what has been helpful for me is having someone else review and have second eyes, especially someone who's not in my field. Mm -hmm. because uh it's so easy to just sometimes leave things out because you're like oh yeah no they know what I'm talking about and so it can help um clarify what you need to either add more information or take out things and um, but yeah it's once you have an abstract though it's so exciting it's like oh this thing that like <laughs> this can tell what what the whole thing the paper is about or um the article so yeah yeah it's, it's a nice it's deal. an exciting process at the end yeah, yeah. <laughs> And when you think about it, like the abstract is one of those things where you can that you can use, like, let's just say, for example, you know, like someone asks you someone in your family or friend asks you, hey, what are you working on, you know, yeah. and abstract is really that short version that has all the key parts, you know, that someone who's not in your field really needs to know. Yeah. So like that elevator pitch kind of idea, you know, mm -hmm. like 
something, you know, or you run into a new faculty member who might be interested in what you're doing in your department, mm -hmm. and they're like, so what have you been working on? And, yeah. and abstract is that it has like that little part, you know, that anyone wants to know. So it's a really, it's handy in other ways. Yeah, yeah. And it's really helpful too, reading through other people's um before I, I write any, I just usually will read through other people's just to get an idea. Because I mean, I'm always learning something. It's like I, yeah, yeah, I'm always learning. So. Well, um, if others, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, um, I appreciate you listening and hope it's helpful for you. Um, and we're here to help you um, this summer on anything you might be working on writing wise, you know, whether it's an abstract or something else. Um, so uh, I don't want to just, you know, mention that, you know, we work with with students in any field, um, you know, so if it's humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, um, we can help you with that, whether it's something for a course, or even if it's something like an application for an internship or, um, or a job. Um, we work with, with lots and lots of students on those kinds of things, because those two are also highly specialized kinds of, of documents that um, it's, it's really good to get feedback from, uh, from people who understand those genres, um, so that if, if you have anything like that, um, by all means, feel free to, to reach out to us for some feedback. Yeah. And there's two responses in the chat, um, oh. I think. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate it. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, this uh, this has been lovely. And thank you for spending your afternoon with us. And thank you for everybody who tuned in. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Thank you. Good luck with your what you're working on. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Talk to you later.